Thank you. So I have to admit that usually when I get called a rare event, it's not that complimentary. Um, for those of you who are in universities, how many of you love your president? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of my life. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and well, I love that part of my job too. But today is fun for me, um, as Mahmoud said. Um, before I took on this job, I was um, the vice president for IT and chief information officer for the University of Hawaii, and I chased money um, all over. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about a, a project that I've been really passionate about and involved in various forms over the past 20 or so, um, 20 or so years. So first, I always like to plug Hawaii and its place in networking history. Um, everybody knows the Aloha Protocols. Norm Abramson developed those at the University of Hawaii. Um, he actually came to UH to teach and to surf. Um, and he was fortunately very active in his research. And he actually developed the um, protocols in order to help the University of Hawaii solve a problem. Uh, Mahmoud mentioned that we have 10 campuses. They are actually um, spread across four islands. So that has been a challenge for us. And this was an era before um, there was any fiber optics connecting any of the islands. So a radio network was really essential for us. Um, a second really key project known to internet insiders was called the PACCOM project. Uh, that was a guy named Torben Nielsen in our computer science department. And he actually deployed the very first international uh, TCP IP links into Asia, working with partners, um, Jun Murai at the WIDE project in Japan, many of you will know if you're from Japan, Jeff Houston and the RNET project in Australia and so forth. And this was prior to um, the commercial internet extending internationally at all. Um, given our location, we pioneered some of the ways in which we connected to academic networks, um, buying um, indefeasible rights of use on submarine fibers, and um, we've used that strategy within the state and then to collect, connect um, globally as well. So academic networks, uh, most of you who are in academia use these every day even if you don't know it. This is the overlay of networks um, constructed by universities for universities and our education and research partners um, to facilitate our work together. Uh, universities really deployed the first TCP IP networks um, and this is true throughout the world before uh, the telco industry was really interested and there were some protocol wa wars going on at the time um, before TCP IP clearly emerged as the winner. Um, we used to deploy multi-protocol routers, in fact, uh, because some people weren't really sure where this was all headed. But once it became apparent that TCP IP was here to stay, um, one of the easiest ways for corporations to get involved was simply to buy an academic network. Happened on the west coast of the US, happened on the east coast of the US, happened in Australia. Um, and, and what occurred after that is that the universities realized we've just given away our um, intellectual capacity and the basis on which we collaborate and the people we sold these networks to um, don't have the same goals that we do. So by the mid-1990s, universities began to come together in the US. Uh, this was the Internet2 project. Again, in Australia, it's RNET, CreoNet, WIDE, um, in every country, CERNET in China, many people know about CSTNet. And uh, these networks were constructed everywhere and then we began to connect them to each other and create this fabric. Uh, in general, these research and education networks serve a number of purposes. Um, as I mentioned, we connect to each other. Um, and at their heart, what we're trying to do is enable cyber infrastructure empowered research. So um, that has changed over time. You can think of big data, visualization, access to high performance computers or supercomputers that be have become national assets and, and aren't located throughout every country. 
Um, lots of collaboration between people using interesting modalities. I'll show you one that we, um, we deployed in the Pacific earlier this year. Um, and to deploy cloud services so that we can share our work together across universities. We also do technology innovation together. And I'll share a couple examples of things we're doing um, at our university in collaboration with our partners uh, in the US and around the world uh, using, again, what I want to emphasize is an, an interconnected global fabric. So this is just three different pictures of what that global fabric I mentioned um, looked like. Um, in the upper left, this is called the GLIF, the Global Lambda Integrated Facility. These are all circuits that are used exclusively for research and education around the world, and all the uh, operators of these circuits participate. Pretty much everything you see here is 100 gigabits per second, or we're starting to see some 400 gigabit per second. This is a group called the Asia Pacific Advanced Network, or APAN. It's a group that gets together a few times a year to look at um, how we're um, deploying and utilizing networks in the Asia Pacific region. This is Internet 2, the US r &E, National r &E Network. And these are the places where we have international partners. And what I want to highlight is this is us in Hawaii. Um, New Zealand, Australia. This is some work we're doing in Guam that I'll say something about shortly. Other than that, there's pretty much nothing in the Pacific. Here, crosses over the Pacific, but doesn't stop other than Hawaii. And that's the area in which I've been trying to work over the past several years. So the developed world is very highly interconnected, and you can see that from the maps. Um, there's been a lot of work in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, Africa, Caribbean, to bring those um, regions online. And we have now pretty robust networks uh, that are, again, within the region and then connected beyond. But the Pacific Islands has been really slow uh, to move forward. And that's because it's a really complicated place. So what you're looking at here you know, this is a huge area. This is bigger than Europe and Russia, and there's not very many people spread out across this region, and there are significant distances between them. And where you see just one dot, that might actually be referring to an island chain literally consisting of hundreds of islands on which anywhere, you know, there might have populations on a particular island of 100, 500, so it's pretty expensive to deploy infrastructure there. Out of the nations in the Pacific, and I'm leaving out Australia, New Zealand, only Papua New Guinea goes over a million people. Some of these places have populations under 10,000, less than the number of students I have on my campus every single day, and they have to run a country on that, spread across multiple islands in some cases. The economies are weak, I, I won't go through all this. The people are not very well educated, they don't have universities at best. There's something uh, you'd consider to be a community college. Very high incident of non-communicable diseases, primarily um, diabetes, obesity, due to changing diets um, as they've lost their um, traditional lifestyles. Um, not much infrastructure, I'll say a little bit about how that's changing. Um, they don't have creative and competitive regulatory environments. Uh, so it makes it really hard to uh, deploy the kinds of things that we're used to every day and take for granted, such as we're experiencing you know, just the kind of Wi-Fi connectivity at this hotel or you know, wherever you uh, live and work. And this is one of the conundrums to me of telecommunications. Um, these are people who need it the most because they're physically disconnected, but they also have the weakest infrastructure. So let me just pitch a little bit because I talk sometimes to um, the telcos and governments in the region to try to share with them why these research and education networks are so important. Um, first, just looking at the education and health of their nations, um, distance learning is very obvious and you can see the kinds of areas where they need help, where they don't have the capacity to teach their citizens. Um, 
It's also really interesting to watch, and we've been doing some of this work in Hawaii, to try to understand how we deploy technology to advance our indigenous language and culture. And um, literally, the Hawaiian language was on the brink of extinction probably 40 years ago, and it was a very concerted effort to turn that around, including, you know, not exclusively through the use of technology, um, and now um, the language is healthy, thriving. We have immersion schools. We have children speaking it. We have families speaking it at home. It's really made a resurgence. Um, and, and you can see the other kinds of activities to advance education and health. I'll just say telemedicine is critical. Um, these are places that don't have doctors or even highly trained nurses. So the opportunity to bring in telehealth services can really provide a remarkable transformation for their quality of life in many of these island communities. Secondly, I wanna say a little bit about the research that needs to be done. Um, the Pacific is on the front lines of climate change, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and those of you who follow what's been happening at the UN, uh, the heads of some of the Pacific nations are the most articulate advocates um, for trying to get the developed world to do something. I will just say the, um, these are the economies and the nations that are suffering the most. They are seeing their shorelines uh, literally disappear with just inches of sea level rise. Some of these are coral atolls where the total height of an entire island where people live might not extend much more than five to 10 feet above sea level. They have been able to live for centuries that way and they can no longer as seawater um, is encroaching on their agricultural lands. King tides come over the entire island from time to time and climate change is changing the environment and affecting um, their wildlife. And, and I won't go through all of these, but you can see these are not abstract research areas. Um, we are looking to uh, advance with Pacific Islanders so that they can be part of solving the, the problems they're facing. Um, these, are, these are the challenges that they face on a daily basis. And if I'm talking with telcos, I do need to talk about the economic impact. Um, if, and, and I've experienced this first time when I've um, worked with people ex enjoying high bandwidth connections for the very first time. I know you had um, Vince Cerf here yesterday, um, and I met him when we hosted a major internet conference in Hawaii over 25 years ago, 1995. And at that time, we were still bringing people together who were bringing their country online for the very first time. And we had 100 or 200 people from telcos, universities throughout the developing world spend two weeks at the University of Hawaii learning how to bring a country online. What did that mean to bring in the first circuit, the first ISP, the first email system? This was before websites were common. So FTP sites, Telnet sites, all of those sorts of things. And the Internet Society was really instrumental in a lot of that work. And we're still seeing that in the Pacific. Um, where we need to have people begin to experience what high bandwidth connectivity means so they can solve problems and develop um, knowledge-based economic activities as well. And frankly, if you're a telco, you want to develop the next generation of customers who are gonna wanna buy higher speed capacity services to create the economic case to build out that infrastructure. Um, so, I'm gonna show you a picture of USP now, University of the South Pacific in a moment. That was really the first research and education network in the Pacific. Um, there were a couple of projects, NSF funded uh, me at the University of Hawaii to try and figure out what we could do in the Pacific. Um, the European community funded a project with one of my um, good friends and colleagues from Australia. They called it ACP Connect. ACP Connect. Um, to try and assess what we could be doing in the Pacific, and we worked very closely together. And then I'm gonna say a little bit about my current uh, project called PIREN, which is about a $5 million NSF project, so uh, pretty modest. Um, this is a picture of USPNET. So University of South Pacific is really an interesting institution. Um, it's headquartered in Fiji, 
but it is the national university for about 13 different countries. So if you think your organization is complicated, imagine having a board made up of the government of thir governments of 13 different countries that collaboratively have to run a university. Um, they built this network, uh, as you can see, beginning in 1968, as a totally satellite-based network because that's all they could possibly do back then. And they've been gradually migrating segment by segment uh, to fiber as, as that has become possible. And they're pretty well connected. Um, fiber was laid from Australia, New Zealand, to Fiji, to Hawaii, to the US uh, in about 2001, the Southern Cross Cable Network. So Fiji was actually the first part of the Pacific, other than Guam, to be connected at all into this um, high-speed fabric. I am not going to go through these. Um, this is a slide I've been developing over a number of years. It used to have like four things on it. These are all the new fiber systems that have been coming up. And you can see what's remarkable is fiber is now coming in to parts of the Pacific that nobody imagined even five years ago would ever see fiber. When you think about fiber to Wallace and Futuna, these are French protectorates with you know, single digit thousands of people that are getting fiber optic connectivity to advance their telecom infrastructure. This is just a quick picture of watching the fiber go into place um, over the past years. And you can see how quickly this has been developing um, as you see it come in across the Pacific and then gradually you start to see fiber penetrating into the Pacific. That hub that you see there in the middle is um, Hawaii. That's part of how I got interested in this is I happened to be at a pretty interesting place that emerged as a natural hub um, for these activities. So this is um, the, the project I've been working on. This is about uh, five years old, four to five, five years old now. It's funded by the National Science Foundation out of what they call their International Research Network Connection. So we are essentially the US host of the major links that come in to the US for research and education uh, from Australia and New Zealand. So those are developed places, big links, 100 gigabit circuits, that caliber. New Zealand's a little bit slower now as they're coming back online. Um, secondary purpose is to advance our work in the Pacific. Um, NSF was very supportive of this and nurturing of the fact that we can only do it opportunistically as fiber comes into place. Um, I won't say much about all of this, maybe just a couple other points. Um, we generate massive amounts of data here in Hawaii that the telescopes both on Mauna Kea on this island and Haleakala on Maui, you can see it across the channel, um, they consume individual projects, can consume gigabits per second or produce gigabits per second of data. I think most of you know the modern astronomy, they're not putting their eyes up to telescopes. Um, these are massive light gathering, um, um, CCDs basically, um, advanced camera technology uh, that can generate terabytes of data um, from collections of uh, telescopes. And we also actively participate in the measurement and analysis community with our colleagues throughout higher education in the US and beyond. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of our work in Guam because it has emerged as a really opportunistic fiber hub uh, for the region quite a bit, for the Western Pacific, but strategically interconnecting um, within Asia. So this is our vision, you can see. Um, some of these are real, and again, I'm not gonna go through um, you know, all of the links, but you can see the strategic position of the Pacific between Asia and North America and I'll just say um, Australia, New Zealand um, as parts of the developed world. Um, and most of this is coming into place. The dotted lines are still works in progress. We're still gonna have to use satellite for a while to get to some of these places. But we really do envision that the Pacific can become a, um, a fully participating member of this complicated research and education fabric that we've developed over the past 25 years or so across the world. Um, this is um, 
not to scale. That's a picture of Guam and what it looks like in the middle of the Pacific. And um, we, we show it this way because what's been interesting about all the fiber, you can see the fiber that comes into Guam from um, uh, both from Asia and from North America and from South um, into the Pacific and Oceania. Um, it comes into a number of different cable landing stations on the island. Um, this is an area I know some of you are either sticking around or coming back for the Pacific Telecom Conference in Honolulu in January, which is where the people who are building these systems all gather and wheel and deal and talk about the submarine fiber optic technology. But what we have constructed is an open research and education exchange so that any college, university, r &E network anywhere in the region um, can interconnect there and dramatically shorten the paths and the latencies for some of the projects um, that rely on low latency, particularly things that are working in real time. Um, this is you know, the work that we do. Um, so I'm, I was never a real engineer, and I'm certainly not even close to one now in my current job, but this is the work that our engineers do collaboratively when we put in, in this case, it's a, it's a 100 gigabit per second circuit. We do all of the round, uh, round trip testing to make sure the paths are clean so that as we're beginning to develop our network applications, we know any challenges we see are not with the path itself. Um, we were sustaining, in this case, I think, um, seven gigabits per second actual traffic over 10 gigabit links, which is pretty darn good if you've ever tried to compare the um, theoretical performance of a link with actual, actual performance. So the work we do because of where we are is mostly around astronomy. Um, these are some of the key flows that you can see. Um, and our partners, in this case, in Japan, in Europe, um, and on the east coast of the U.S. Um, I'll just mention two of the telescopes here. One is PanSTARS, which is a survey telescope. So what they do is they take pictures of the entire visible sky from Haleakala, um, essentially every night, um, and they can compare the pictures tonight to last night and thereby detect objects that are moving across the sky. Um, so. Um, in the popular vernacular, we are detecting killer asteroids. And it's actually quite real to identify objects before they impact the Earth. And we have several successes. PanSTARRS on Maui has identified more asteroids uh, in its lifetime than all other telescopes in history because it was designed specifically for that purpose as a survey telescope. Um, Subaru that you see, it's here on um, this mountain on Mauna Kea, that's actually the national telescope of Japan. So obviously getting the data back to Japan for Japanese science, scientists is of critical interest. Um, we use these specialized devices called data transfer networks. Um, this is an approach that's been developed again by the r &E network community around the world. We deploy those around our community so that we can monitor performance of high-speed links and ensure that the science is not impeded um, by the networks. And again, um, just because you put in a 100 gigabit or a 10 gigabit link does not mean you actually get anywhere near that performance unless you have pretty smart network engineers doing an awful lot of tuning who understand exactly um, what the high-speed data applications look like. Um, I, I won't read this. This just gives you a sense. This is a, um, actually, I think our guys are presenting this paper right now in New Orleans at an Internet 2 technical meeting. It gives you a sense of how um, they go down to understanding the checksum algorithms and whether those algorithms perform at high speed the way they theoretically perform um, on paper over lower speed links as well. And they also dig into the um, TCP IP protocols, how to tune those. You know, everybody knows you gotta do jumbo packet sizes over high speed links or you don't get any performance. So this is a community of academic network engineers working together um, to improve these science data flows to support researchers around the world. 
Um, one of the projects we're involved with um, is called NetSage. So Sage is the um, visualization technology originally developed at the University of Illinois, Chicago, um, Tom DeFanti. Um, we hired away Jason Lee, who now works at our university, and developed some amazing visualization things at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in Honolulu, and what we've been doing is looking at the flows by discipline, and then we can break down project by project um, who's using the capacity. This is something the funders want to know, so that when NSF is giving us money for high-speed links, they can see that this is supporting other NSF research um, by the s astronomers that they um, support. Um, we have been working to deploy high-speed networks as well. This Hawaii Iki cable, and I'm going to show you the next slide, has a video with sound. Hint, hint. Um, and I'm going to show you some work we've been doing. What's interesting about this Hawaii Iki project that you see on the right is it was developed by somebody who lives in the Pacific. Um, the business case for this is to connect Australia New Zealand to the U.S., but he put in um, branching units so that he could connect Pacific Islands opportunistically. And this is a really interesting, you couldn't do this 20 years ago, but you can now. You leave the branching units in the water, and then when an island community wants to connect, you've just got to go down and then connect and then pull the other end to the island and build out a cable landing station. Um, so what they have done is one of their initial partners was American Samoa, which um, only had a coaxial cable kind of technology. They had DS3 circuits that were designed for phone systems until um, last year. So this is a project we went into with um, American Samoa Community College, supported by the Hawaii cable, which supplied the, supplied the capacity, and the American Samoa Telecom Authority. Today we are celebrating two fantastic milestones. The first one is the first year anniversary of American Samoa connections to Hawaii Cable. And the second is the launch of Holo Campus, the first 3D remote learning platform in the Pacific. Well, uh, aloha and um, welcome to this event, to the other half of it. It's such a pleasure to see you all. This is a set of relationships empowered by this technology and the remarkable new Hawaii network. Connection. So this is the American Samoa side. For years to come. Today I'd like to share some results from a project that is focused on one of American Samoa's most important water resources, challenges. It makes me feel fortunate to be alive in this era. Um, I didn't think that we will ever see it. You know, being here in American Samoa, I didn't think that uh, we'll, we'll see a hologram in real life, so it's actually pretty awesome. The Hala uh, campus, uh, it will be a huge breakthrough for our uh, instruction and our education here at the American Samoa Community College. Especially from the student perspective, now they can enjoy the quality of instruction from, from the University of Hawaii. And we have friends like Remy Kalasso and Hawaii has made this all possible. And we're very thankful for this partnership, and we hope that it will continue. So in, in that case, um, the, the guy who wasn't me, who you saw on the hologram, um, he was explaining his research. He's a University of Hawaii faculty member who did research in American Samoa about water quality. So um, you can't drink the water out of the taps in American Samoa and he talked with them about the challenge and the problem um, and how they might think about addressing it. Let me mention this will be, I think, our next one. Um, we've been working with a group putting together something called PolyREN, or Polynesian Research and Education Network, based in French Polynesia. And this just gives you a picture. There, there is fiber between Tahiti and Hawaii, and so we're assembling this network. It's kind of interesting because um, you know, French Polynesia is French, but this Gump station is uh, one of the most advanced marine biology research stations in the world. It's on the island of Morea, right across the channel from Tahiti, and it's actually owned and operated by University of California at Berkeley. So um, 
This gives you an idea of how when we put together the local RE network, connect it to Hawaii, then they can go off to colleagues in Australia, New Zealand, uh, to California, and all the way to France over this existing fabric of networks that we've all assembled um, over the past 20 ish years. So, um, as I wrap up, this is actually one that got dropped into our lap um, last month. So it turns out that, um, actually this should be Antarctica, not the Arctic. Um, there's a 500 megabit per second satellite link from Antarctica, the, re the NSF research station, to Guam. And so we're figuring out how to interconnect. It lands at a military base. So you've got to figure out how to get onto the military base to get to our GOREX, our Guam Open Research and Education Exchange, where we will deliver the data from the Antarctic to um, the US mainland, where most of the researchers are, or up to Alaska, which has one of the strongest polar research programs in the world. So as a thought, um, I I'm probably made this look a lot easier than it was when I show a lot of years of work all at once. Um, but it's a challenging environment in which to work. And the only reason any of these projects have succeeded, um, I gave you a taste of it with um, the American Samoa, the number of partners who had to be involved at both ends, local loops, submarine fiber segments. The technology that was deployed actually came to us from Canada. Um, we, we need to be collaborating across sectors and with many different partners. So with that, um, let me stop and see if there are any questions, including about why I put canoes at the beginning and the end. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lasner, for your great and informative talk. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. So uh, I will just uh, go through the list. Okay. So the first one is, uh, they want to know what impact do you think how Leo satellite uh, constellation internet service like Starlink uh, would have uh, the, uh, the impact in the Pacific? So um, satellites have a really important historic um, functionality in the Pacific because we didn't have fiber in much of it until pretty recently. Um, there's a lot of um, geostationary satellite that's used for backup, um, particularly for telcos. I'll, I'll just hi highlight two really interesting satellite projects that I've been paying attention to. One is called O3B, which stands for the other three billion. Um, and it was unveiled oh, probably five or six years ago. And um, it's interesting because it's a Ka band technology and it's a medium Earth orbit and it targets places that don't have fiber. Um, and so it's pretty low latency. Um, it's a little tricky because it has to do the handoff, but places that haven't had fiber in the Pacific have been adopting O3B as an alternative to more expensive and uh, higher latency geostationary. The other is a company called Pacific, which is also a Ka band technology, but it's a lower barrier of entry. It's geostationary, so you don't have to have two dishes handing off. Um, if you're familiar with medium Earth orbit, that means they're moving, so you can't just point at one. Um, so um, I don't think satellite, uh, the last thing I guess I should say is I mentioned earlier that a lot of these places have many islands they have to connect to. Um, so they need to either be using satellite or if the islands are close enough together, they'll do a lot of microwave shots between islands. And we actually, our university uh, built a microwave network to connect our islands before we, our university campuses before we had access to fiber after we did the original Aloha work in the 70s. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I will just go through another question from the audience. So, uh, the audience asks, so Hawaii is known to be the vacation world. So, as the president of University of Hawaii, how you manage to attract top-notch faculty members and the students to, to, to the island? Yeah, so, um, you know, people work hard here, <laughs> is all I can say. Um, it's For those of you who are in any university, you know, if you don't 
teach and do research, you're not going to end up with tenure. Um, so I think the way we think about it is um, if you manage to take a whole weekend off, you are in the most beautiful place on earth. Whether you want to surf like Norm Abramson did, there's amazing hiking. Um, we have a lot of people who love scuba, snorkeling. Um, and we have a lot of people who really appreciate um, the host culture, the Hawaiian Polynesian culture, um, and they find themselves wanting to be here. Um, it's an expensive place to live. Um, so um, unless you're coming from somewhere like San Francisco, San Jose, um, it's pretty expensive to get a house here, but um, we're always looking for good people. <laughs> Thank you again, Dr. Thank Nasana. You very much. Yeah. Thank now you. With that, I'm going to ask Doug Zuckerman to come here. Oh. <laughs> That's what they tell me all the time. I should be centered. <laughs> Not censored, censored. That's for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, mahalo, as we say. Okay. Mahalo. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. It was really a pleasure to be here again. Yeah.